2023 Army 10 miler. Let's get into some race details here. So this is the, the the landing page here. You can get a couple really great visuals from this. And this is exactly what it looks like out on race day. Um, don't know if there will be the paratrooper there, but you see the hand cycle individual there, wounded warriors alike. This is the race course uh, from years past. You can see people are dressed in sweatshirts. They're in jackets. Very very accurate or great depiction of it on a good day there. But just want to let everybody know. That that the weather can turn sour very quick, and when it does, it gets um, not the friendliest of conditions out there. So keep that in mind as we talk about here. The first thing that we are going through is the arrival and departure here. So race day, October 8th, 2023. Uh, getting to know everything before you get to the start line. Parking, there is no parking allowed at the Pentagon. Uh, there is Metro available. Crystal City parking garage is free. There's also paid parking available there. Um, and again, Crystal City parking garage is free, but they highly encourage you to check the Metro and use that uh, to the best of your ability. There is also... Um, uh, a little link you can click here to search the metro to see how your ride is impacted on the weekend. List of road closures are listed as well during this page here. You can see the Virginia closures, the DC closures, and there is a free event shuttle. So spectators can board the free event shuttle uh, from the Pentagon South lot to the finisher area. Um, and it's highly discouraged for racers to do that. Um, uh, there's also a huge no backpacks mandate. There are no backpacks, no gym bags. Make sure you are not using those. Otherwise, you will be asked to get rid of those. And that is uh, the arrival and departure. Next up is our race day schedule. And I think there is one typo here. We'll talk about that later. Uh, 4 a.m. to 1 p.m., the free event shuttle is, is starting to run. Uh, and then 6 to 12.30, the Clement Ned garment check for runners only from Pentagon Metro Station to the lower bus terminal. Uh, 6.20 to 7.35, wheelchair athletes and wounded warriors and waves 1 to 4, one or runner wave access. This is not the start. This is the ability to line up in your waves. Um, 7.15 to 7.30, the Golden Knights Jump. You saw those in the, the pre-event photos from years past. Pretty cool. 7.30 to 9, waves. 5 to 10, runner wave access. Runners only. Uh, and then 7.40, we have our National Anthem and the Flyover, which is always super cool. 7.50, the Wheelchair Athletes and the Wounded Warriors start. If you uh, happen to see one of these individuals out on course, make sure you give them an uh, an appreciative nudge, uh, compliment them, and, you know, don't just run past them and ignore them. You know, it's awesome what they have done for our country. 8 o'clock to 8.55, waves 1 to 10, wave start times. Um, and you can view the start line activities in the Pentagon North lot. 8 to noon, uh, we have the finisher area, and 10 a.m., top individual runner results are posted. And then at 10.30, we have individual award ceremonies, and I believe that is happening in age groups that are in 10-year bands. And I think the exception to that is from the 15 to 20-year-old or 15 to 19 age group. Uh, garment check and policies. So when it is on Sunday from 6 to 12.30, it is at the Pentagon Metro Station lower bus terminal. Uh, steps to check your garments. Again, no backpacks or gym bags. Everything must be in the clear plastic garment bag that has been provided from Athlete Pickup, which you cannot access on race morning. Use a primitive marker to write your race numbers. Markers will be supplied, so you don't have to bring those. Detach the garment check tab from your race bib and attach it to your bag. Strongly recommend not leaving mobile phones or wallets and valuables in your garment bag because it is simply just a bag. So make sure if you have a super crew that is headed to the race with you, you are utilizing their Sherpa abilities and you're having them uh, hold on to your valuable assets. Picking up your garments, you walk or take the free event shuttle back to the garment check and retrieve your items no later than 1230. Race course security information, again, a lot of the same things. There are uh, personal music devices are prohibited out there. So headphones, earbuds, MP3 players, iPods, uh, and of course, weapons, firearms, anything of that kind. You know, that is uh, discouraged and not allowed. Strollers and baby joggers prohibited unless you have a special race exemption, which uh, very few people will get. Uh, 
authorized items over here, fanny packs, mobile phones, heart rates, watches, medical kits, gel packs, water bottles, water belts, standalone hydration system, Pentagon security information, much of the same. Wave start. So our wave starts, <clears throat> runners are already seated ahead of time, and that will be the color of your bib. It's going to be earmarked for your start corral. So runners in waves one and two can access their waves between 6.20 a.m. and 6.45 a.m. Runners in waves three to ten can access thereafter starting at 7.10 a.m. and that lasts until 9 a.m. All runners proceeds, proceed to the access control point and start wave corrals. Volunteers will help guide everyone there. Rules for switching. You cannot switch to a faster wave, but you can switch to a lower wave. All right. Scoring is listed over here. And again, the waves, the age group uh, is confirmed here, 15 to 19. And then it is 10 year bands after that, with the last one being 80 plus over there. To be eligible for to receive an official race result, runners must cross the start 10K and finish timing mats uh, faster than a 15-minute mile pace and complete the entire course within 2 hours and 30 minutes. Uh, they talk about other individual awards here and individual division eligibility, things like that listed there and you can read that later on and this is the course broken down mile by mile for everyone here water stations are here this is our start line over here this, there is going to be a water access point i don't know how accessible that is going to be on race morning but just know that it is there this one is for the finish line area this is not for the start and it immediately have a aid water or a water station listed there so just note that that is for the finish area so you're going to finish and just just keep walking and this is kind of that finisher area over here uh, looping back up from the start we're gonna do a quick overview and then we're gonna dive into the nitty-gritty details we have another aid station a water aid station right before mile two that will keep climbing up and then we will drop down all the way till mile 4.25 ish you're going to have another aid station listed there you are going to do another longer loop here right before mile seven we have our second to last aid station and then after eight and a half miles you're going to have your last water station for the finish so what this means for you i could not find anything that listed anything about the aid stations having other individual items like gels or goos or anything like that so what that means is if you plan to use it you're going to have to bring it yourself so the only thing that is going to be provided to you is that water out on course so with that said this is the the route here let's dive into some more nitty-gritty details uh, that everybody loves preceding the race so uh, just know that this is a little bit off uh, but it will serve the purposes that we need to for this video here so for our start line here we're just going to zoom in a little bit so we can get the, the top half of the course so before we uh, dive into the major, major things here, we are going to talk about some area exposures that are going to be very open to the elements. So again, this is typically a cooler race. Uh, most times uh, it's going to be, you know, a little bit cooler. Spectators are going to be wearing sweaters, maybe some jackets. Runners are going to be wearing a little extra, um, as is usual. You know, and again, if it rains, it's just going to complicate things a bit more, and you're probably going to have to wear a little bit more than you want to to stay warm and and prevent um, that excess heat loss out on course. So the first major area uh, that we do have really, really open to the elements is this area right here after we cross the bridge. And then even until we get right around here past Georgetown uh, Ferry Landing right in there. Uh, the second area we do have a uh, huge weather exposure is right over here. Third is obviously the bridge over here. And believe it or not, this area back through here does get a little open to things. And if it is uh, really, really windy or rainy or a combination of the both, um, that's going to be one of the last major areas that you are going to experience some excessive weather. So let's go to the top one really fast here. That area that I talked about, the weather exposure is going to last pretty much for this whole duration over here for that first one. Second one is right through here. Third big one that we have is right through here. And that fourth one, uh, typically it happens right through here that you are kind of hit with some extra stuff. Uh, but, you know, that is not to say that the initial part of this course right here is not open to the elements. It is a highway. It's really open. Um, and again, you know, 
if the wind is blowing, it's howling, you're going to be surrounded by a lot of runners. A lot of people don't think about that or just kind of block it out because they have the mental ability to do so for this first mile here. You're going to be really crowded on for this uh, for this first mile, but don't let that affect things. Don't let that get in your head. And, you know, be paying attention to what is going on always, right? And we know that that first aid station is coming up right before mile two here. And let's kind of zoom this out. Oh, I can't zoom this out for you. Um, but we know that that first aid station is coming right at mile, right before mile two, right up there. And that is right up in here. So for this first mile, it is a steady uphill drag. I mean, we're going at a point two ish um, incline here before it starts to kick up a little bit where we have a one, 1 1.2, 1.4% incline. And again, what a lot of athletes do not realize on this course is that that incline is going up. Most people are more concerned about dodging other people, trying to establish their self in their corral and even catch up to the corral beforehand. If you have the ability to run with power or pace or heart rate or a combination of all of those, hopefully you do. I would be utilizing those metrics in addition to trying to not trip over other athletes and establish your race here. You don't really necessarily run out of things until you get past this point out on course. And even then, it's going to be crowded. The whole race is going to be crowded. But if that first mile is pretty packed in, you know, and it starts to spread out. But the problem is the roads start to narrow and narrow as the race goes on. So this point in time, you, you, you'll really start to be able to kind of run your pace here. and You're not just running the PAX race anymore. Because of that, we do have a little bit of a downhill. And again, it's just very, very hard to run away from people up through this area right here. That's because we are going downhill. It's about a, um, a 0.5 negative decline here. So uh, a lot of athletes are really, really motoring here already. You know, we just went that first mile. Most athletes can hang at a mile uh, that's too high for their pace. And then coupled with the fact that we do have this downhill pairing afterwards, it's kind of a, a great recipe for race failure right here. And it happens in the first uh, mile and a half, 1.4 miles. And it just you just don't realize it. So make sure you're utilizing all of the data pieces that you have. Again, they are pieces to the puzzle. The more pieces that you have, the more you will be able to kind of put that jigsaw puzzle together. What a lot of people forget is the heart rate right through this point here. Uh, monitor it, see what's going on. And because this is a decline, your paces should be faster. Yes, but your heart rate should still not be climbing by the time you get to the end of this section here. We will have a little kick up uh, as we get to Roslyn and we start running through there. Uh, this is uh, one of the major inclines out on course. And one of the, the bigger ones that we see here, this 2.2% incline, um, it's very, very common for athletes to, again, I mean, we're in the first two miles of the race still to just completely motor up these hills here and just really, really crush it. It's awesome to watch. Be very, very careful here, okay? Watch your pace, heart rate, cadence, all of that good stuff. You know, make sure you're fueling. Make sure you're you're hitting the aid station up here. You're not just totally blowing through it. I don't care if it is 20 degrees out there, okay? You need a little bit of something. You know, if you do have a goo, a gel, whatever, and you didn't take one at the start line, now would be a good time to kind of get that in, you know? If you're running with any fuel, this would be a great time to pair it with some of the water at the aid station or anything like in between, you know? And, and it, the terrain gets a little chunky through here as we get to the bridge. It just gets, um, it doesn't allow you to run the way that you want to. If you maintain your pace and just your, your rhythm of things, you will start to actually catch up to some people or prevent the distance from growing in between you two. Now, again, another major um, danger on this course is this these next couple of miles once you get to the bridge you've done a lot of the hard work here so of the 230 feet of elevation gain we've already done 81 of them when we get to that bridge here when we start to come out of Roslyn crossing the bridge into DC proper here uh, and, and this is a steady downhill grade 0 0.2 0 0.1 it's it's awesome, right? And the problem is it can be too awesome. Very, very common for athletes to take this drag over here. And again, open to the elements. You're exposed here. Not a lot of shade. Not really a lot of shade on this whole course. But 
right through here, athletes really, really forget things. And, you know, if it's a really, really packed day, a lot of people showing up and a lot of people running around you, this is the point in time where a lot of athletes choose to go, right? And again, what I'm going to tell you is you want to be going, but you want to be going in control here. You don't want to totally lose track of your form. You don't really want to start flying down here with the inability to keep that running form together. Because as you start to kick up through these points in here, uh, these inclines are going to hit harder and harder if you're running well beyond your limits here, well beyond your limits. Uh, and these inclines are actually going to be a welcome sight. Most of the times, uh, you know, at, at running races, anytime you see an incline, you, you got to prepare for it. But this is actually going to be very, very beneficial for your legs if you ran this downhill segment properly. If you totally floored it and you're flying down this segment, these hills are going to feel really hard. And that should be a warning bell that's going off in your head. If you're climbing up these and it's really, really hard, it's like, okay. I need to check in with myself. I need to see what's going on. I need to, am I fueling properly? Did I go too fast? Do I need to check in with my hydration? How's my running form? And the, the list just goes on and on and on. And identify what the main culprit is. If you're running with a friend that's way too fast for you, might not be a bad idea to let that friend go during this downhill segment here. You're going to drop down again, and when you really think about it at this section right here, uh, this major one, we, this is about a three-mile section, and we have 65 feet of elevation loss with only 25 feet of elevation gain happening here, here, and here. All right, so there isn't a lot of uh, ability to create that variance. There are a couple pieces in there, which is why you need to be running within your means here. After this point in time, right then the race kicks up so remember we've covered uh let's call it about 90 feet of elevation gain during this section here we have 58 let's call it 60 feet of elevation gain so this is the <clears throat> kind of the meat and potatoes of the course right here this is where you can catch up to people put some distance on you or they can really start to run away from you right through this point here and uh, another major, major thing at this point is a lot of people are going to be, as you get closer and closer to the bridge here, a lot of people are going to get a little more and more nervous. They're going to start to slow down naturally, and they're just not going to want to go over that bridge fast for most people, and they're going to view it as an opportunity to explode, right? So if you've ran everything right up until this point, these area, this area here from about 5.3 up until 5 point, or 6, excuse me, 7 miles is going to be kind of your time to start turning the screws on people, start to pick the pace up. And if we go back to our aid stations here, we're going to have an aid station right down here, uh, weather exposure area number two, and we are going to have a uh, aid station right through here, right before mile seven. So it's a perfect opportunity, right, to kind of leapfrog a lot of people over the bridge here, over the bridge. Um, <clears throat> And again, this bridge is going to be, it's going to be a little, a little challenging. This isn't the right um, percentage points for the bridge. There is going to be a bit of an incline. I'm not going to lie to you. And a lot of people will just kind of give up here. Um, the race is hard. They're going to get to this place. They've overdid it leading up to this point in time. And this, this bridge is a run killer for a lot of people. Weather exposure area number three, right? <clears throat> the wind is probably going to be in your face. I'm just going to be honest with you. No matter even if it's a perfect day, the wind is always moving through this point here. You're going to be battling it to cross the bridge. So the people that can stay mentally strong are going to be the people that are successful from here on out because it's uh, largely in your head and what has happened beforehand that's going to dictate whether you're ha going to have a good or bad two-ish miles left here for the rest of the race. You're going to keep climbing after the bridge here, and these hills will get you if you're not ready. So again, your major race has started at 5.3, and when you get to mile 8.5, you know, if you've done it right, that's not enough time to totally explode here. It's not going to feel totally great either, but if you spent the first 3.5 miles really, really pushing the pace somewhere you, ha you, you shouldn't have been, these hills are going to hurt. They're going to feel terrible, and you're probably going to have to slow down a lot here. If you've paced this well, these hills should be hard, right? But they're not going to be excessively hard, okay? And again, 
every step you take is going to be another step closer to that finish line. So you should be getting more and more motivated as you get closer and closer here. Tuck it under the highway before we t dump down into the Pentagon area and the finish line. And again, the last aid station out on course is right out here, right um, after you get off the highway here. So again, I would not skip that. I really wouldn't skip any of these aid stations out there. If it's a hotter day, all of these areas, you're going to have to use the water to help cool yourself off, fuel up anyways. Uh, and again, even if it's a colder day, I wouldn't advise skipping the aid stations. At least take a couple of sips of that just to be on the safer side. And that is the Army 10 miler in a nutshell, guys. If we zoom in on the, the course terrain here, you can see that these elevation changes that are happening out on course, it is up and down, up and down. And this area right through here, um, it's going to be very, very critical that your legs are ready to go. So after mile five, uh, if you want to simplify it from mile five, your race should start there. You got to get yourself to mile five quick but in control and have the ability to pick the pace up after that a lot of runners at this race will um, do the opposite they will fly for the first five and then they will feel the pain for the last five so hope everyone has a great army 10 miler classic course out there one of the best running races there is uh, and good luck to everybody like, subscribe, share. If you need any coaching advice or coaching, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you for this race and beyond. And good luck, everybody.